Mao Zedong was born in 1893 at a village called Shaoshan in the Xiangtan County in the Hunan province of China. He was born in a poor family and when the American reporter uh, Edgar Snow uh, met Mao in 1936, he told him that uh, his father had already become a middle peasant and he also sup somewhat supplemented his income by small trading. Initially, Mao got himself admitted in some elementary school where Confuci Confucian learning was the main form of learning and then got himself admitted in a higher school at Tungshan. It was from his arrival at this school uh, that Mao first uh, could have a first-hand experience of the stratification of Chinese society. And that was the real beginning of Mao's political career. And it enabled him to have a more broader outlook of the Chinese society, which was not there in his secluded rural life. Now, after Tungshan, he moved to Changsha. It is a bigger town. It was there at Changsha that he got an intellectually alert and politically conscious student body. And that provided Mao with an ideal training ground for his apprenticeship as a political leader. And in fact, there he got many friends and comrades who in a later period joined the revolution under his leadership uh, and made it successful in 1949. Now, Mao is said to have led a Spartan way of life uh, when he was, a school, uh, he was in the Changsha school. He used to take a cold bath every day in summer and in winter. He was very fond of swimming and mountaineering. And in fact, in the year 1916, he traveled over a wide area in the countryside of Hunan, uh, living on beans and water and sometimes literally on nothing. Such physical toughening was to prove very useful when he first led the First Front Army uh, during a long march in 1934-35. In 1917, Mao was at Changsha, and there he formed uh, a society which was called the New People's Study Society, and which in some way or other played an important role in the future course of the Chinese Revolution. This society did not have uh, any political identity, uh, nor did it have any concrete program of action. But the members of this society, uh, they uh, accepted the method of seeking truth from social practice. And in fact, that became the method of the Communist Party of China. In September 1918, Mao went to Peking, where he met eminent intellectuals of China at that time. As for example, there was Li Ta Chao, who was a librarian and professor of political economy. Then we have Chen Tu Siu who was the Dean of the Faculty of Letters in the University of Peking, and there were also many others. And Mao got a job as an assistant in the library, not as an assistant librarian, but as an assistant in the library. And that helped him a lot to get acquainted with the writings of many thinkers, many theoreticians. He particularly referred to Kropotkin, Bakunin, Tolstoy, as also Marxist writings. And Kropotkin, Bakunin, they were anarchist writers. And at one point of time, Mao, as is Mao said, uh, he himself became an anarchist for a brief period of his time. Mao had full admiration for Li Ta Chao. Li Ta Chao was a person who introduced Marxism into China. In fact, he was to be killed by Chiang Kai-shek's troops in 1927. The coming of the May 4th movement of 1919 found China in convulsion and Mao along with other members of his new People's Study Society, they issued broad, broad sheets and they called a strike of the students in, uh, in many parts of Hunan and uh, a large number of democratic ideas took shape in their minds, as for example, anti-Confucianism, uh, then the demand for democracy and science, uh, of course, uh, acceptance of Marxism, etc. Now, all these 
characterized the May 4th movement of 1919. And all these ideas were zealously accepted Mao, by Mao at that time. Mao wrote a series of articles at that time. And in fact, one of the recurrent themes was on the emancipation of women. He wrote eight to nine passionate articles that the task for the emancipation of women was closely linked up with the task of the Chinese Revolution because these are inextricably tied up with one another, with each other. That was Mao's realization, which of course he developed in a later period. Now, the Communist Party of China was formed in July 1921. It was formed on a boat on South China Lake uh, in the Chekiang province of China in the guise of a holiday excursion that was formed. It was a, it was a secret uh, organization, clandestine organization, so it was formed secretly. Mao became the secretary of the Hunan province. And one of the first acts of Mao after he became the party secretary in Hunan was to organize the workers, uh, coal miners, anyone coal workers, and the railroad workers. He was involved in both, directly involved in both, to organize the working class movements, both in the mines as also among the transport workers. Now, meanwhile, the international political context had been changing. As for example, in 1920, the second Congress of the Comintern was held. At that Congress, Lenin came out with a thesis, which is known as a thesis on colonial questions. And there he pointed out that the communist international should enter into a temporary alliance with the bourgeoisie in the underdeveloped countries. But they should not merge with it and they should retain their initiative, their independent spirit of action, even when they are forging an alliance with bourgeois democracy. So initiative must be in their own hands while the party or the proletarian groups, they forge alliance with the bourgeois democracy or bourgeois parties in the uh, underdeveloped or, uh, countries or colonies. That signaled the beginning of a debate within the CPC. And that was held in the Third Congress, held in 1923 at Canton, on whether one should make an alliance with the Kuomintang. Kuomintang party at that time was led by Sun Yat-sen. It was, of course, a bourgeois party. So that was the debate. What should be the attitude of the CPC towards the Kuomintang? Now, there were two tendencies appeared at that time. And those two tendencies were uh, identified as deviations. According to one view, which was represented by Chen Tu Siu, in fact, Chen Tu Siu became the first secretary of the Communist Party of China. Chen Tu Siu believed that Ch Chinese revolution was to proceed through two stages. This is the first stage, and it is the stage of the bourgeois democratic revolution. So in this stage, the leadership in the revolutionary movement was to be given by the bourgeoisie. And so the working class should play a very insignificant role. And after the accomplishment of the bourgeois revolution, the second stage would begin, social, the stage of socialist revolution, when working class definitely would come to the fore and give the leadership. Now, uh, this tendency was regarded later on by the Communist Party as capitulationism, tailism, tailism behind the uh, bourgeoisie, tailism. So that was one deviation, as has been pointed out. Uh, the other view was represented by a person named Chiang Kuo Tao. Chiang Kuo Tao believed that the Chinese revolution was a single stage revolution. The Kuomintang party was a reactionary party. So there was no need to form an alliance with the, with the, with the Kuomintang party. And so in this stage of revolution, the working class should come to the fore under CPC leadership and they should initiate the revolution. Now, this was again regarded as de another deviation. It was regarded as sectarianism. It was a sectarian outlook. Now, uh, both these ideas were criticized at this third Congress of the CPC in 1923. The party decided that the CPC should help Kuomintang develop its own organization. At the same time, the CPC should develop its own organization also. So both alliance and also independent spirit of action. They, they felt that that was a lesson 
to be drawn from Lenin's thesis on colonial questions. It was this which formed the basis of the first united front between the Kuomintang and the Communist Party of China from 1924 to 1927. We know that Kuomintang party was led by Sun Yat-sen. Sun Yat-sen had also developed his new ideas, his three major policies, such as the alliance with the Soviet Union, alliance with the Communist Party of China, and assistance to the workers and peasant struggles, since both were in agreement. So they came closer to each other. The first united front was formed, which was to be directed against the northern warlords, uh, feudal lords, uh, under different imperialist forces, imperialist groups. So it was feudal, typically feudal. So it was against them that the northern expedition was directed. Within a very few months, a large number of the provinces of China uh, came under the control of the Revolutionary Army. But at that point of time, disunity developed within the United Front. Sun Yat-sen had died in 1925 and he was replaced by Chiang Kai-shek as a leader of the Kuomintang party. He usurped the post of the commander-in-chief. He gradually started to fill up all top posts by his men who were drawn from the feudal or bourgeois ranks. He started to set up a counter-revolutionary dictatorship. So that was one side of the picture and they had their center at Nanking. On the other hand, the revolutionary forces under the CPC and the progressive elements, left-wing elements within the Kuomintang, they smashed the main forces of the warlords and set up their center at a place called Wuhan. So there was one revolutionary center at Wuhan and the other counter-revolutionary mm -hmm. center at, at a place called Nanking. Mm -hmm. The victorious advance of the Revolutionary Army towards the Yangtze Valley made the province of Hunan the center of a countrywide peasant movement. At that time, few people within the uh, Chinese Communist leadership understood the, uh, uh, understood the strength of the peasant movement. Uh, they always put emphasis on the working class, not on the peasants, because Soviet model was the only model before them, and they were not at all interested in China, in the, in the Chinese peasantry. But the fact is that despite the leadership, the peasants of Hunan, they rose in a very great movement. Hunan peasant movement was one of the greatest peasant movements uh, un, uh, initiated by the CPC in the initial stage of its struggle. This movement can never be separated with Mao Zedong's revolutionary activities. He was totally inextricably connected with the Hunan peasant movement. In fact, from 1925 to 1926, he had been running the National Institute of Peasant Movement in Canton. And then when the Northern Expedition started, he went to Shanghai to take the post of the chairman of the Committee on the Peasant Movement. And then he proceeded to Wuhan, the revolutionary center, and to be in charge of the National Peasant Association. Main aim of these institutes, peasant institutes, institutes for peasant movements, was to prepare cadres ideologically, to go to the villages, to help peasants get organized for struggle, and in this way also to declass themselves. In fact, they formed peasant associations, helped forming peasant associations in many counties of Hunan, and by November 1926, the total membership of the Peasant Association was something between 13, 13 and 14 lakhs. And these Peasant Associations became the sole organ of authority in the countryside. They uh, carried on their anti-feudal political struggle, economic and ideological struggle, smashed the power of the landlord, established the authority of the Peasant Association in the countryside, they effected reduction in rent, clan authority, they challenged theocratic authority and the authority of the husband. Night schools were opened and of course peasant militia was organized for self-defense. Now in support of the peasant struggles, Mao uh, went to Hunan in January 1927 and he prepared a report which came to be known as the report of an investigation into the peasant movement in Hunan, popularly known as the Hunan Report. Now, this report fully uh, appraised the role of the peasants in the Chinese Revolution. A scholar named Ho Fines in his book, The Broken Wave, has pointed out that Mao's Hunan report has three important elements. 
first thing is that Mao in the report asserted the emergence of a new revolutionary situation. Second, he also singled out a new force of the Chinese revolution, that is the peasantry. He was the first to point it out. And third, he adopted a new attitude towards violence. He pointed out that a rural revolution is a revolution by which the peasantry, oppressed peasantry, overthrows the uh, authority of the landlord, authority of the feudal forces. And in this process, terror was essential. Red terror was essential for a brief period of time to counter white terror, to counter counter revolutionary terror. And in fact, this a report later led to a controversy among the scholars known as the Maoism controversy. Uh, according to one opinion, uh, here Mao ba shifted the center of revolutionary movement from the city to the countryside, unlike the classical model, that is the Soviet model, mm -hmm. which made the industrial proletariat and the cities as the main centers of revolution. So Mao shifted it from the cities, from the industrial proletariat, to the countryside and the peasantry. And according to that school, this was Mao's, one of Mao's original contributions to Marxism-Leninism. According to the other view, this, it, Mao did not, when, while Mao uh, emphasized the role of the peasantry, he did not mean, it may meant that the peasantry would play a decisive role, the main role in the revolution, but not a leading role. Leading role was to be given as in the Soviet Union, by the working class. But what he emphasized is the role of the peasantry. And of course, he pointed out that there, we should move back to the backward villages for various reasons. And later on, he developed the theory of the agrarian revolution. It, it was developing at that point of time, encirclement of cities from the countryside, creation of base areas, etc. So his contribution lies in making the peasantry, in giving the peasantry what was its due which was never given in the earlier period. That might be his contribution. But otherwise, leadership given by the working class, no doubt about it. And uh, But the peasantry to be the decisive force rather than the working class, peasantry also to be the main force rather than the working class. This was the main difference between the two. Anyway, now meanwhile, the, uh, we are talking about the advance of the uh, Northern Expeditionary Army. And that was followed by an uprising of the workers in Shanghai uh, in February 1927. Then in April 27, Chiang Kai-shek, backed by foreign forces, British, Japanese and American forces, sent troops to kill thousands of workers and party members. That was the Shanghai massacre. And it was the Shanghai massacre which ultimately put an end to the united front between the CPC and the Kuomintang. Now, at that critical juncture, CPC, in order to salvage the revolution from defeat organized another uprising in Nanchang in Kiangsi in August 1927, where about 30,000 troops took part under the, under the command of Chou Enlai and Chu Te. And though this uprising was defeated, it, it marked the beginning of the Red Army. It was from then on that we can uh, trace the beginning of the Chinese Red Army. It was followed by an emergency conference where decision was taken for the autumn harvest uprising which was to take place during the harvesting season. It was also defeated. And then the forces, they shifted to the Chinkang Mountains, as was decided earlier. And it was on the Chinkang Mountains, it, was, it uh, lay on the Hunan Kiangsi border, that there the first revolutionary base was set up in 1927. The Nanchang Rising was followed by the Canton, Canton Rising. It was also defeated. During that point of time, Mao had to fight two deviations again. One was the right deviation by Chen Tu Siu, who advocated a policy of total retreat by withdrawing all the forces. He was very afraid. He was trembling with fear. Chen Tu Siu, very unfortunate. So he was in favor of the withdrawal of all the forces from the battlefield. And the other was the left deviation, this time represented by Chu Chiu Pai, who still believed that China was on the stage of a continuous upsurge, even when it has already suffered a setback, uh, an a major setback in 1927. Sir, will you please explain the concept of Taoism? Chen Tu Siu's idea was that since it was a bourgeois democratic revolution, it has to be led by the bourgeoisie. But the working class should, pay, should play only, a, not only a secondary role, but insignificant role. 
Now, by saying so, what he was actually doing is that the working class should tail behind the bourgeoisie. That was not Lenin's observation. Lenin said that you, the working class should have its own independent initiative. They should retain their in initiative in their own hands. But tailism or tailing behind them does not mean that you have initiative in your own hands. The failure of the autumn harvest uprising forced Mao to take refuge in the isolated mountain range on the Hunan Kiangsi border uh, on the Qingkangshan mountains. And there he was joined by, by another military group headed by Chu Te. Chu Te was a former warlord minded official, now turned communist. And the first revolutionary base was of the Red Army was formed. Now, the French historian Cheno, he writes that the process which uh, led the Chinese communists to the peasantry was an external one. It came from the towns. That is, the whole Marxist idea came from the towns. It emerged in the cities, not in the countryside. And the essential motivation for this shift was the need to pursue the revolution in the least unfavorable conditions possible. And it was a new strategy, no doubt, entirely new strategy, which was not seen in the case of the Soviet Union, Soviet Revolution. And uh, the new elements in the new strategy began to appear in Mao's writings during that period. Uh, one can mention three important articles by Mao written at that time. One is, why is it that red political power can exist in China? That is the first one. Then a struggle on the Qingkang Mountains. And the third is a single spark can start a prairie fire. These were the three essays which he wrote during the period from 1928 to 1930. Mao pointed out in those essays that armed struggle depended on the existence of geographically limited revolutionary bases. The Qingkang Mountains are covered with forests and wild beasts. And uh, in such a situation, it was possible to seize power and retain it. It is to take advantage of the terrain, advantage of the terrain, without necessarily achieving victory throughout the country. And an important difference with the 1917 revolutionary effort, that is October Revolution, was that the insurgent regions in China were the most backward economically, the least integrated into the market economy, and the most tenuously controlled by the central government. And this was a major departure from the classical model of revolution, which assigned a leading role to the, not only to the industrial working class, but also to the most developed zones. And uh, that is where we have the modern industry. And the strategy naturally was one of prolonged struggle. It would be a protracted struggle. And there is no question of seizing political power in a few days or, a, or in a few hours. There was no prospect of victory or defeat, immediate prospect of victory or defeat. As in Paris in 1871, during the Paris Commune, Petrograd, in 1917, or in Shanghai in 1927. So the struggle was to last for many years. And accordingly, between 1928 and 1930, 11 main insurgent bases were set up on the Qingkang Mountains. In fact, in November 1931, a conference was held at a place called Juichin, where Mao became the chairman of the Chinese Soviet Republic. And a constitution was adopted by the Communist Party, which affirmed that all power belonged to the workers, Soviets. That is, workers' organ of power. Soviet is a common, yes, it originated in the Soviet Union, but Soviet was also, the word Soviet was also used in China. In the same sense, it had its labor law, which provided an eight hour working day, workers insurance against sickness. Then there was an agrarian law, which envisaged the confiscation without compensation of feudal holdings and their distribution among the poor peasants. 
One important point is that this policy of giving precedence to the agrarian revolution was not supported by the CPC leadership in general. And Mao and Chute represented only a minority line at that time. They were in a minority. And the party leadership directed Mao and Chute to attack the cities. Initially, they agreed. They attacked them knowing fully well that those attacks would be defeated. Then they attacked and then got defeated. And then when the same directive came, they simply refused to obey the orders. And so they were deprived of all the top positions at one point of time. But ultimately, when those same leaders, they were defeated in the towns, they took shelter in the countryside. So ultimately, it proved that the agrarian revolution, one has to go back to the villages, that should be central revolution. Anyway, uh, there was another development also. And so what you find is that there, was, there were divisions and inconsistencies within the CPC, no consistent policy within the CPC. Side by side, Chiang Kai-shek along with others, they carried on encirclement and suppression campaigns. Lacks of soldiers, troops. Lacks of troops surrounded the hills to carry out encirclement and suppression campaign. Burn all, loot all, destroy all. The policy which was introduced, which was made, uh, followed also by the Americans in Vietnam and also in other places. Burn all, kill all, destroy all. Now, they could withstand four encirclement and suppression campaigns. But then in the, in the year 1934, there was a fifth encirclement and suppression campaign, which they could not withstand. And this was one of the reasons, not the only reason, which ultimately forced the CPC to start on its historic long march from South China to North China. The first stage of the communist movement in China uh, since its birth in 1921, the emergence of Mao Zedong as the leader of the Chinese Revolution, uh, the formation of the First United Front 1924-27, uh, the end of the First United Front because of Chiang Kai-shek's policy of repression and persecution, and then we have the Hunan Peasant Rising uh, and the creation of the first base areas on the Qingkang Mountain on the Hunan Kiangxi bordering region in South China.